Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jabril. I'm a Lead Portfolio Analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Adrian Nelson. Adrian has spent 20 years in the staffing, VMS, and MSP arena in management positions. In her present role as Director of Global Services, she draws on her extensive experience as a veteran of the contingent workforce and hospitality management industries to ensure that SIA members know and use staffing industry analysts, research, and experience excellent customer service. Her career has encompassed contingent workforce management for domestic and global operations, client services, sales, and implementations with MSP, VMS, and staffing companies, in addition to management roles with Hyatt Hotels. Her experience includes contingent workforce implementation, strategy, and program project management. Specializing in metropolitan and global markets, she has been based in Washington, D.C., Silicon Valley, and Paris, and deployed to London and Hong Kong. Staffing Industry Analyst is a global advisor on contingent work known for its independent and objective insight. The company's priority, um, excuse me, <clears throat> proprietary research, award-winning content, data, support tools, publications, and executive conferences provide a competitive edge to decision makers who supply and buy temporary staffing. In addition to temporary staffing, Staffing Industry Analysts also covers related staffing sectors. Founded in 1989, acquired by Crane Communications, Inc. in 2008, the company is headquartered in Mountain View, California, with offices located in London, England. Experts at Staffing Industry Analysts closely follow staffing trends. They develop key metrics and insights to assist a staffing company owner in the current dynamic U.S. economy to drive sales and recruitment efforts. In today's Industry Insider Webinar session, Adrian will focus on the latest developments in the staffing industry, including staffing industry's strategic issues, developing trends, future opportunities, and current challenges. By the end of this rapid fire update, you'll know the expert predictions that will help you shape your growth strategy for your staffing firm. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right hand toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Adrian. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with everyone um, today. Uh, as a, I had a wonderful introduction, and I appreciated that, a little bit about um, staffing industry analysts, too, so I appreciate that as well. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about staffing trends for, for this year and really beyond. Um, one of the things, though, that I want to explain before we get started is who how we get this data and information. SIA gets our data information from the entire ecosystem of contingent work. So when we're talking to our customers, our customers mean corporate buyers, staffing firms like yourselves, uh, suppliers to staffing firms like Tricom, related services, investment bankers, staffing associations, government agencies. So we really encompass the entire ecosystem of contingent work, and that makes us and you uh, stronger when we're talking about trends and predictions. These are some of the things that we do. We do um, conferences, for those of you who uh, don't know about us, we do conferences for both staffing firms 
and for corporate buyers, um, sharing thought leadership on uh, uh, both ends. Uh, also, we provide corporate membership uh, to the, both entities. Um, they're both a little bit different. Um, and then we have some products associated uh, in terms of we have certification products for program management, contingent workforce program management. We have webinars every month for our corporate members that give you the latest and greatest research, which I pulled some stuff from there today, so you get sort of a sneak peek. And then we have, of course, our global news um, and our buyer publications, as well as our uh, blog, The Staffing Stream. These are some of our council members. And uh, I just uh, wanted to share these. The reason I wanted to share this with you is this actually makes you stronger. It helps you see the other side. Today I'm going to be a sneak peek also at the buyer survey for those of you who are not corporate members. If you're a corporate member, you have access to the buyer survey. So take a look at that. This is where our research falls. These are areas that we cover. So just uh, uh, you can sort of see that's what looks, if you guys are familiar with our website, that's what falls on our website as well. And that is what is, will be shared today is uh, items from this research pool. So our agenda today, you know, when I talk to staffing firms, these are the things they're asking me to talk about. So that's how I set this agenda. We'll talk about the big picture, the outlook for staffing. We'll talk about strategic issues, what others are thinking. We'll look at key insights, developing trends to help you plan and be, you know, a subject matter expert for your customer and your company. And then current challenges and some futuristic uh, sort of viewpoints that I'll leave you at the end with. Um, just to give you some food for thought and maybe help you to shape your future strategy or at least start thinking about it. So with that, let's get started. The good news is we can party like it's 1999. GDP has the fastest growth in three years. Uh, that is great news. All the economic um, sources that we use, Conference Board, the Fed, the IMF, um, together, we uh, looked at that, and then the average of that forecast was about 2.9% for 2015 versus 1.9% for 2014. So that's, a, that's good news. The bad news is, hey, I hate to be a downer here, but there's a risk to that forecast. Um, we're in an expansion period right now. There's a chance that expansion will end, if you remember the last recession. Uh, the last economic expansion in 2001, that lasted uh, at what was uh, 6.1 years. In 1991, that was 10 years. And in 2009, that was 5.8 years. We are counting down now. So we're at about 5.8 now in terms of an expansion. So is a recession looming? I don't know. It's a possibility. But um, one of the good, so on with more good news. One second. The staffing industry does follow GDP, so that's good news for all of us. It has a very high correlation. Uh, so just bear that in mind for this year. You should be doing pretty well right now. Um, most of the times if I'm in a live presentation, I say, you know, show, a show of hands as to if business is good, and usually the whole room, the hands are up. So hopefully the same goes for those in our audience today. So one of the reasons I'm really excited about it is that there's a great market for staffing, just the U.S. contingent workforce market, and that's excluding um, Statement of Work, SOW, is $371 billion in 2013. The reason we exclude Statement of Work is that there's really no good data tracked by the government for us to do that. So just so you have an idea, the global market, so if you're doing anything global at all, is an amazing $3.2 trillion in 2013. That's a huge opportunity for our industry. Um, it equates, just to give you an idea, the global marketplace for staffing equates with the global technology industry. So that's huge. Um, it's a fragmented business for us, though. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, when we're breaking down this graph, we look at temporary staffing, which we all know about, at 103 uh, billion, and then we look at uh, non-agency workers at 77, um, and then we look at non-agency independent contractors at 191 billion. Now, when we talk about those, uh, that red part, the non-agency temporary employees, that's what we're talking about. There is uh, 
you know, third party workers, interns, athletes, et cetera. So just so we're clear on that. Um, and then independent contractors that are billed to the client by agencies are not shown here. So uh, just a little background on that. Now in March, surprisingly weak March job gains. Really uh, very interesting. Unemployment is pretty much unchanged. It's at about 5.5%. It's been under 6% since September of 2014. Go U.S. economy. Um, the uh, last 12 months, the job gains were about were mostly over 200,000. So this little uh, dip in March, where we only had job gains of 126,000, was quite jarring. Now the BLS is constantly revising their um, their numbers, so uh, we'll be monitoring this. But if you look at the graph on the right, where it shows that slight um, sort of nice acceleration, we like that. We like that 2.3 percent year-over-year acceleration. It's nice. It's steady. Uh, that's what we like to see when um, we're looking at uh, numbers. Uh, any kind of spikes are generally not sustainable. <clears throat> we saw some job declines in March in uh, manufacturing, also in construction and natural resources. Now we think that perhaps, um, you know, I don't know if any of you out there had a miserable winter, but we think weather might have been a factor here, um, especially for uh, construction and manufacturing. There was also a West Coast port strike in February that may have affected this. Um, so, you know, the healthcare employment here, as you can see, just keeps growing, uh, and uh, the more volatile sectors are down, like the uh, construction and manufacturing. All righty. So that's sort of the macro view from the BLS. Let's talk about temporary health growth. Uh, January and February, again, there was that month-over-month -month decline. You can see those dips on the left. And then uh, we uh, had in March our first bump up, which is great. Um, it's 5% growth year over year. You can see that graph. It's, it's sort of going steadily okay. We're okay in terms of temporary help employment. Um, we think that the bumps down uh, prior to March were probably, again, uh, weather related, but uh, that's just uh, one theory, as it were. Um, so, one of the things that I also wanted to show you is that uh, household survey shows very low unemployment rates for college graduates, and that is certainly one of the things that uh, we look at. I know here in Silicon Valley, uh, we have a very low unemployment rate, however, unfortunately, they can't find any place to live once they get those jobs. So that's another uh, determinant of a tight labor market is when unemployment rates for um, college graduates go down. And then the temporary uh, market forecast. Um, so this is the staffing market sizes by customer and industry. So when you're looking at our industry as a whole, you can see that there's lots of opportunity in manufacturing and healthcare. We expect healthcare to, gr healthcare to grow in terms of um, Technology and um, telecom, I think everyone knows that those industries are fairly hot. Finance, insurance, again, so this is sort of stack ranking, uh, the uh, temporary staffing market sizes. Another place that you can get a very good viewpoint of temporary staffing market sizes is in our Geo Atlas, if you ever want to take a look at that. That's an excellent source to show you geographically where the uh, staffing markets uh, have the most um, impact. So it'll give you the revenue in each market geographically by metro area, state, et cetera. <laughs> the strongest and weakest state employment markets. Well, you can see that uh, go south uh, for the strongest uh, employment markets. I think that's due also to the manufacturing, that whole logistics arena, um, the trucking, the warehousing, uh, that is uh, showing a lot of uh, growth in employment. So here's our, our forecast, hot off the presses. This is our April forecast. In our recent webinar, we had our entire team of analysts go in-depth on this forecast. Today, I'm just giving you sort of the broad overview. 
Uh, you can see that uh, our forecast for uh, 2015 is 6% in total temporary staffing growth, and uh, 2016 we are forecasting 5%. The clear winners here, though, are uh, education uh, for 2015 um, in double-digit growth. If you have an opportunity to get into uh, temporary staffing and education, there is a, a great opportunity there. Um, one uh, company in Michigan has actually done uh, quite well in uh, st substitute teachers. So it, it makes total sense. So keep an eye on that. This is a very sunny forecast. Um, again, 6% growth equates to about $115 billion total for 2015. 5% in 2016 is at $121 billion. Last year, we were at 5% growth predicted, and we came in pretty close. Um, I think we'll exceed our peak in 2016 from 1999. There's growth across all segments shown in this forecast, low, steady. Um, we're in, again, the sixth, almost the sixth year of economic expansion. Uh, engineering is the uh, slowest uh, because of the oil and gas impacts. Again, we talked about education for a second, and uh, look at healthcare if you can. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, you know, everybody asks about ACA. We're still learning about ACA. Um, right now, we're seeing that it's boost boosting bill rates for industrial and office clerical. It doesn't affect professional very much. It's sort of already in there. It's a significant percentage, though, of lower rate staffing. There's a, a 1 to 2 percent increase in bill rates due to ACA in 2015. 2016 is forecast about 1 percent more as the enrollments and cost of insurance um, go up, and the cost of uh, hospital insurance will also be included, and that will increase cost as well. <clears throat> so increase in bill rate, but probably maybe not margin. <clears throat> Manufacturing, I mentioned manufacturing earlier. One of the reasons we talk about manufacturing is it's a bellwether. Um, you know, this is an interesting story. So you look at the solid job growth trends in manufacturing now, and you think, hmm, this is a uh, segment that lost 30% of its jobs over the last 20 years. It's significant that it's showing growth here and in its forecast. I think probably due to just-in-time delivery, warehousing, again, record levels of trucking volumes being reported, that, uh, that sort of uh, contributory. <clears throat> All right. Let us move on to IT. Everybody loves IT. Great margins, professional-level workers. There's no, uh, I think, news to uh, you guys out there here, but this is a whopping 53.5% growth for IT through 2022. That's huge. Um, all non-farm employment, about 22%, so that's double. Uh, many occupations in IT were below a 2.5% unemployment rate last year. It's a very tight labor market. Um, it's good for staffing. If you're not in, you should maybe figure out a way you can get in. The performance will continue. It's amazing growth. Again, on this graph, you can see that the IT is in the yellow at 53.5% and the uh, non-farm that is non-IT uh, in blue. So, All right, so I've bombarded you with charts and graphs and statistics, and so now let's switch gears for a second. Let's talk about uh, strategic issues and the evolution of work in our space and how technology drives it. Um, you know, companies are maintaining a core group now. I think you're seeing it. They add and withdraw talent as needed. It's great for staffing. It's having some interesting impact um, on us as a society and the way we think about work. Uh, what was it? I heard something on the radio today about it was, uh, you know, the opportunities for work are changing driven by technology. I mean, think, think Uber or uh, uh, some of the other organizations, and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute, but that's just one, one way to work, right? <clears throat> so here's some of the uh, workforce uh, classifications that we have right now, and um, I almost want a, a, a dictionary of, an ac of um, acronyms. 
there's variety for sure. Um, this is the result of uh, the evolution of talent and the gig economy. It helps us, technology enables it. This is also a disruptor to our space. Gen X, millennials, boomers, they want, they like to work differently, they wanna work more flexibly. It's great for us, but then again, we have uh, technology and other firms that are coming into our space that could be market disruptors here. <clears throat> right now, we have a 15% contingent workforce penetration rate. What that means is that buyers that we survey have reported to us in our survey that 15% of, of their workforce is contingent. Now, that's not just temporary staffing. In some, in some organizations, it's as high as 50%, and these are large organizations. So I just want you to bear that in mind. The opportunities that exist are phenomenal for our space. Okay, so let's talk about workforce composition. What does it look like? Well, it used to be that most of us were employees, some were consultants, and some for were you know temporary workers. Really, it's moving to a different mix. You know, gone are the days when you were a temporary just because you couldn't get a job. Now, being a contract worker or a temporary worker or consultant, whatever we're going to call it in the in the days to come, is really because you are expert in your field. You can carry your bag of skills with you. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, tenure anymore. There's a shrinking average employee tenure. 2014, ages 25 to 34, the average employee tenure was three years, uh, 4.6 years over all age groups. That's huge. Here in, um, in Silicon Valley, for uh, IT professionals, uh, especially programmers, it's less than a year, the average tenure, which is uh, amazing. They just jump from uh, technology company to technology company. Uh, I think you'll see that there are going to be more non-employees or contract labor uh, generating IP. You're seeing it already. There's an expansion of roles that companies want to be filled by quote unquote non-employees. I don't like that term because you know what, they're generally an employee of someone unless they're an independent contractor. Um, you know, this is uh, something that uh, can, you know, contribute to um, the uh, globalization of workforce within the employee and non-employee segments. Again, a, a lesser share of employees, more flexible work, it's great for temporary help. Uh, contingent workers are generating products, intellectual property. You know, there's, there's globalization. There's also legal risk uh, that they want to address with contingent workers. And then, of course, the rising cost of real estate and benefits as well. So, all of those things are contributing to this evolving workforce composition. When we ask buyers about what they want, and we talked to, again, about 70 of the largest buyers of contingent workers on the planet, and they are saying that, you know, uh, they have the operational oversight, right? They have, uh, they have MSPs or they have their own program managers, they have VMS, they have great staffing firms that they work with, so they've got sort of the operational oversight done. They can comply with KPIs. They can uh, look at operational efficiency, policies, and compliance. But what they really need is they need to be moving into uh, the strategic area. They're asking more about total uh, talent management. They want to move away from the operational to the strategic. They are not there yet. But what I think staffing firms have an opportunity to do is to help them and guide them, because you really are the experts. Help, help them think about how flexible talent can be utilized and advise them and innovate with them as a partner, because those are the things that are going to separate um, uh, your expertise from others. Here's another uh, viewpoint of the evolution of uh, contingent workforce models. Uh, there's more volume and uh, less margin as uh, they as buyers move up this continuum, but hopefully there's lower cost for you. Um, this is more decentralized and moving towards total talent management. So on the left, you have a decentralized couple of suppliers, procurement done on an ad hoc basis, and you move up to preferred suppliers, then maybe a master vendor, then maybe uh, some sort of program management, and then total talent management, which can encompass 
the entire contingent workforce, so con independent contractors, uh, non-employees, and employees. <clears throat> Buyers are using a, uh, a significant number of different management strategies now, and this is from our recent buyer survey. One of the things I wanted to uh, point out is this is a way to guide you in, in conversations with your customers about these models. One of the ways that, um, that uh, we look at this is, for instance, in the yellow, where it's, it's ex buyers say they're going to explore within two years. On the, in the blue is what they have in place today in terms of management strategies. If you look at SOW, Statement of Work and Contingent Workforce Program, 40% are exploring that. That's an opportunity for staffing firms to engage. Um, be, be ready. Uh, strategic planning is uh, another one that includes contingent worker uh, planning. Um, be able to you know, talk about global management. 45% of buyers are interested in doing this. And finally, what I think is most interesting is for those of you who are looking to get into new clients, you know what? Almost 40% of them say they're wanting to try out new suppliers, so be ready. Uh, the interest in offshoring has waned. Uh, MSP is still there, alive and well. But let's take a look at the next slide. So if you look at the MSP, uh, this is a managed service provider or a program manager. Uh, customer experience versus a staffing firm's experience. You can see this is uh, both based on uh, net promoter scores. You can see that uh, the buyers think they're great, 49% think uh, are promoters of the MSPs. But on the other hand, the uh, staffing firms are uh, not so happy with them. I think everybody out there uh, has uh, felt this at one point or another. Um, the good news is, is that um, Buyers said in the, our 2014 survey that an MSP was their best strategic decision, but uh, they sort of rated the MSPs lukewarm. I know they're not popular with suppliers, but here's proof that the customer experience is actually a little bit different. A lot of MSPs are actually going internal. The uh, companies are starting to gain the knowledge not only just through uh, market uh, maturity, but also through certifications like we provide. Um, it's a natural progress progression, but I can tell you that program management is definitely here to stay. <clears throat> One of the ways you can deal with MSPs and make it work is, is uh, make it about you. Make sure you're creating the best uh, models in terms of uh, lower cost recruiters, maybe offshore, less salespeople. You need relationship managers there, good to great technology. You want to celebrate and document your MSP successes across your business. Uh, make sure and document it. You may not be able to use the names of the companies, but you can certainly uh, utilize the reporting that they provide. And look at your internal setup. You know, does it make real sense when you're servicing these, uh, these big programs? Another strategic issue, what do you think? RPO, the outsourcing of permanent, what we call permanent hiring, right? Nothing's permanent. And uh, are we getting there? You know, are we getting to uh, sort of a merge where it becomes total talent management? I mean, temp to perm is definitely rising. Try it, you know, people want to try before they buy or, you know, sort of date before they get married to an employee. Uh, you know, it's rising. There's a 13% increase in payrolling. 44% get jobs through networking. The result uh, we think will ultimately be uh, what we call total talent management, which sort of looks like this, okay? So you have traditional employees there on the left. They're managed by HR at this point. We have workforce planning on the right, which includes uh, talent strategy, business alignment, talking to the business, comp and benefits, learning development, training, that type of thing, metrics and analysis. And then on the bottom left, you have uh, what we source, uh, we talk about as contingent, temporary staffing, independent contractors, statement of work, um, any kind of internal pools. Uh, and then uh, and they are usually, you know, uh, the result of agencies, MSP, VMS, and direct independent contractors. That's the composition there, managed by HR and procurement. And then outsource services, typically managed by procurement. And... Uh, 
it is uh, mostly consulting and outsourcing firms. Think of, you know, if you outsource perhaps a receptionist desk or, uh, you know, where they're completely responsible for the staffing and uh, maintenance of that desk or a cafeteria. <clears throat> so now I've told you about the whole enchilada, total talent management. Let's uh, talk about developing trends. What's new? What's interesting? You know, there's so much out there right now. It's, uh, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm always seeing something new literally almost every day, certainly every week. Uh, one of the things is uh, different uh, staffing operational models. They're driven by technology and globalization. So you guys probably have used this, virtual and offshore uh, recruiting, video interviews. Uh, most of these are mainstream. Uh, virtual offices by worker and client demand, right? Technology is pushing this evolution even, even further, and I think there's more to come that we haven't even seen yet. Another developing trend, uh, what we call the human cloud, online staffing. There is a huge amount of money and interest in this, and it's our space. It's the contingent workforce space. Uh, they want a piece of our pie. There's huge growth here. It's a market disruptor. Each of these focus on a different angle. You know, you look at things like My Crowd there on the right. Um, it helps uh, companies find talent for specific tasks through a desktop application. So, for instance, PowerPoint or Google Docs. One click, they can you can hire a designer or a proofer without leaving the application. It's risky, but all of these make sense. Next Crew, it's a white label. It partners with staffing firms if you're interested in something like that. Work market, local, freelance talent. So there's all these different flavors of uh, human cloud and online staffing. There's also a range of online staffing players that are in place today. And they sort of go from where it's on site to more remote. Uh, virtual work in this particular graphic. You can see that TaskRabbit, NextCrew, WorkMarket, OnForce generally go towards more on-site, local focus. Um, there's also some other ones like Wanalo that uh, do actually by the hour. It's not on here, but it actually does one where you can, you know, for instance, for people to demo uh, something or just work for an hour, it's a uh, uh, mobile app. And uh, very interesting, came out of uh, Coca-Cola, I believe, was the uh, seed funding for that. Uh, add in FMS. What is FMS, you ask? Another acronym. Freelancer Management Systems. They manage engagement for these independent contractors and freelancers and give companies better visibility to the independent contractor pool. Um, they're sort of a VMS for independent contractors. Uh, we'll see what happens with them as well. So these are, uh, again, in this slide, this is um, just some examples from 145 identified players today. <clears throat> so going back to the buyer survey, when I'm talking about developing trends, again, let's, uh, let's look at a statement of work and project workers uh, you know, there's a significant increase seen there. Uh, we also want to, um, you know, be careful that uh, <clears throat> it's the way to um, sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, get around uh, maybe a program manage management system, an MSP through uh, procurement, but is it legitimate? Um, if you decide to do statement of work, remember, manage the overtime work to maintain your profit, look at your asset allocation and in intellectual property that you're providing, make sure your contracts are strong. Um, and then um, it, on the bottom on independent contractors, you can see that there's a net uh, decrease. Um, the reason is we believe that independent contractors will come in through statement of work. So keep your eye on that statement of work. It's tough to get in, but uh, I, I would encourage you to look at ways you can do that. Another trend, robotics. We did a, um, a survey with uh, a company and we looked at 702 jobs based on susceptibility to computerization. And the factors that they, they, they um, analyzed were, the first one was perception and manipulation. Uh, another was uh, created, so that means like finger, manual dexterity, work in awkward, cramped spaces. 
The second was creative intelligence, like fine art. The third was social intelligence, negotiation, persuasion, caring for others. And you can see that the probability of computerization is listed here um, and the highest risk jobs. <clears throat> and then, um, for instance, the IT computer support specialist compared to a library technician, 65% probability versus 99% probability. Um, <clears throat> and then office clerical. Um, and then when it talks about cargo and freight agents, that's uh, due to the robotics involved in pick and pack for warehousing. <clears throat> so that's why uh, that came up so high. So the, the news here is probably don't want to be a library uh, tech or a data entry here, but the good news is, is that you, uh, you want to be uh, a surgeon, a teacher, a social worker, a therapist, or guess what, an HR manager. Does that sound close to sort of what we do in general? So uh, interesting news there. You can see I, uh, the graphics I used were sort of going from uh, someone who was uh, having a cashier to doing our self-checkout now, which is pretty much uh, the norm. <clears throat> the other thing I want to uh, talk to everyone here about today is standardization and market maturity. Because of the way our space has evolved and expanded, uh, we have some great tools available. We have uh, from staffing industry analysts, certainly, and uh, these are some of these are um, at no cost. So we have our lexicon, which is terminology used in the industry by buyers and sellers alike. We have a contingent worker bill rate graphic so that you can educate yourself and your customers uh, during your onboarding process using uh, also uh, global readiness, if that's of interest to you, and contingent worker engagement best practices as well. So we sort of have all these tools available to you, and those are at, at no cost. These are used typically to onboard new employees or to educate customers or yourselves. We also have a certified contingent workforce professional class and uh, certification, and so this can be a training opportunity or it can be a certification opportunity. It's available online. It is in program management. So it's not going to educate people on how to recruit better. It's more about metrics, quality, efficiency, cost, risk, and looking at that. So I just wanted to uh, share that with you. Now, current challenges and future opportunities. I mean, one of the things that, um, whoops, I get a little bit ahead of myself. One second. That was a punchline. So I guess, you know, there's lots of challenges out there, right? There's ACA, there's sales, there's recruiting, there's retention. I mean, FLSA lawsuits are up about 500% from uh, 1991 through 2012. Staffing firms are frequently caught in the crosshairs. Google, Apple, um, you know, staffing firms are having uh, lawsuits alleging workers aren't paid for all hours work. These are um, public record. Uh, so there's uh, lots of challenges out there. Um, from our buyer survey, we did um, look at uh, ACA, and uh, when uh, we initially asked buyers the, uh, who, who, if they expected to pay uh, no share of ACA costs, 62% said they would pay no share of ACA costs in 2012. Well, as you can see, in 2014, that number changed drastically, with 36% um, saying they would pay no share. Most buyers expect about 20% um, expected to pay some costs. So you can see on the left, it says 36% said no share. And then it goes on to varying degrees. The, the majority, um, or the highest percentage, excuse me, not the majority, said that it would be about $2. 20% said that we, they would pay uh, $2. Um, there's a huge difference now that reality has set in. Uh, late last year, you guys spoke to your customers. Here's the reality of what you told them about ACA and, uh, you know, what uh, they were going to do with the information that was provided about ACA. So um, buyers in the categories on the left, so the industry, for instance, finance or manufacturing, uh, said the Affordable Care Act was most likely to increase the use of. Finance said full-time employees. Look at manufacturing. Again, ding, ding. There it is again. Increase the use of agency temps. Um, transport warehousing as well. Um, in terms of skill, industrial said they would increase their use of agency temps, as did uh, personnel and uh, was uh, HR. And then um, on, 
In terms of decrease, though, what's interesting here is that most said they were going to decrease the use of independent contractors. Just doesn't make sense anymore in terms of risk. Uh, ACA, in, you know, obviously increases costs with uh, di lower direct labor costs. Uh, the independent contractors, again, uh, ACA is driving customers away from them uh, to W-2s. That's good for staffing. Keep that in mind. Tough skill set. So, what's the skills we ask buyers? What's the skill set that you spend the most money on? Well, overall, I think you you all guessed it. It's IT. However, industrial follows, um, and then engineering. When we asked about IT, what was the skill that they were looking for the most? They said managing and modifying company-wide enterprise software. <clears throat> And uh, the second in engineering specific niche skills, and then for industrial and logistics, it was forklift operators, welders, and drivers. IT is number one again, industrial is number two. <clears throat> so this is an interesting slide. So you sort of knew this, but this shows you the average number of years of consistent profitability by the industry the staffing firm served. And this is from the um, staffing uh, company survey. This is years to, uh, of average uh, consistent profitability. Um, that's the basis for this. So you can see IT um, and office clerical there in terms of segment. Now, one of the things I really was excited about sharing with you was our uh, sort of a cool tool that we have called um, the pay rate range finder. And what it enables you to do is to look at, for instance, office and administrative roles within a given geography here. I've looked at, uh, I believe, Illinois, and uh, it, that'll be on the next slide. But on this slide, it gives you a heat map of where the greatest number of jobs are. So you can see that um, uh, the dark green is the greatest number of, uh, I did secretaries and administrative assistants for this one. Um, it's kind of a nice way if you want to expand your business, even just, you know, um, sort of uh, on an adjacent state basis or uh, nationally. And you can do this for lots and lots of different jobs, anything pretty much the BLS list. The data is fairly fresh. It's from 2013, so it's not too bad. <clears throat> And this is the pay rate range finder where it gives you, so the one, the first one gave you the heat map of where uh, jobs are. This gives you the actual pay rate for secretaries and administrative assistants. This is a, another part of the tool. And it compares it against the U.S. average. So uh, you can use it for lots of different jobs. We've had staffing firms ask us over and over for this type of tool, and now we have it. So if you're interested, and you're a corporate member and you don't know where to find it, please give me a call and I'll be happy to help you. If you're not a corporate member, give me a call and I'll be happy to help you too. Uh, this is one of the fine items our research team has produced. Another opportunity. So, healthcare staffing. It's, you know, check it out. I mean, it's just been a, a real growth industry. There's a lot of things that are contributing to it, right? The aging baby boomers, the um, ACA, you know, it's a hard market to get into. I'm not going to kid you, uh, but there's one area that isn't as difficult, and that is uh, probably um, home health care. You, you know, it's not uh, certainly locum tenens where you're recruiting doctors or travel nurses, but it is an area that you can get in. So um, if you are thinking about it, that's one place you can get in, and uh, I wanted to just bring that to your attention. So let's talk about some long-term industry futures. Um, we're going to look at sort of a crystal ball and uh, look at some potential scenario. We'll talk about direct connection, VMS everywhere, the triumph of talent, and the good old days again. So let's go. Um, they, I'm not sure if these are challenges or opportunities, but we'll see. So direct connection, it's already happening. It gives visibility, transparency, to work history, rates, skills, quality. There's a network effect here. The first mover has the advantage. It can drive everyone to one platform to connect direct. Who do you think it could be now? 
Um, you know, I you know you look at companies like uh, LinkedIn, maybe I, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly something to consider. I'll give you an example of direct connection and how that's worked. So, and and this applies to staffing and recruitment. So let's look at travel agents versus real estate agents. Historically, staffing is an intermediary for the marketplace, right? Think of travel agents and realtors. We all bring buyers and sellers together, but there's a potential for disintermediation. So what does that mean? Okay, so travel agent employment down 38% from 2002 to 2012. Real estate employment up 29% from 2002 to 2012. Um, there's a value add in matchmaking. Technology makes it easier. Um, but, you know, from a travel agent perspective, right, I don't know about you, but I can, anyone can book a flight, right? They get, the travel agents got sort of uh, more commoditized, although there's still very good travel agents who help me with my travel and um, who I consult with. Real estate, real estate though, is a different um, sort of uh, sell, right? It's consultative, they're partners. You need expertise to navigate the complexity. Does this sound familiar to you guys? Um, I think that we are, uh, whoops, I skipped ahead of slide here. I think that we are again um, in a very good position. We are, con we are cons consultative and we partner with companies to uh, make sure that um, they are getting the best value for their dollar and a good quality product. Again, you wouldn't buy a house without consulting with someone. It's just a big ticket item. I think talent is the same. Um, so tie the direct connection to your business, right? Look at some implications. So you can help buyers and candidates with the complexity that uh, they're seeing. You can offer concierge, white glove service. You're already experts. You can be a legal shield against ACA by engaging workers for companies. Payroll is growing. Remember that uh, 13%? BMS everywhere. That's our second scenario for it. This is a technology and a tool. This is not a managed, uh, a managed service provider. It's different. We, when we look at this, we think that BMS may be at 100%. Everyone's going to have a technology tool and their ability to see workers in, to some, in some form. This may be very realistic as integrations become more common. I mean, look at SAP buying field glass uh, is one uh, way to look at that. Um, there's other companies who are also investing in um, tools like that. And then the implication uh, for scenario two BMS everywhere. You'll have lower margins but higher volume. It's not all bad. I mean, look at the past decade. Temp was $85 billion in 2000, $111 billion plus today. There's a high penetration rate. Many new models with less automation, less cost. A firm could act as an MSP or as a master supplier. It's happening now for, you know, mid-size to smaller firms. You know, as um, options for staffing firms, you're going to maximize your efficiency. You can do offshore or centralized recruiting, uh, be niche recruiters and specialists targeting specific skills, acting as a coach and guide and advisor, as usual, right, for your clients, and having a light model, perhaps, of MSP that you initiate, some sort of innovative MSP variation. Scenario three, the talent wins, right? So who wins the war for talent? Door number three, talent is, flo is focused, flexible. It's lock and load to core businesses as a flexible asset. Scarce skills will have the edge here because technology will be the enabler. So um, <clears throat> there's not, um, you know, that's relating to low unemployment, significant skill shortages, and no significant increase in technology or penetration use. I think the third one probably isn't going to happen. I think there's going to be a significant increase in technology penetration use. And then the implications for scenario three, talent. Uh, that's the happy staffing manager sort of uh, dancing there. Uh, hiring, HR and hiring managers drive the process, procurement uh, less so. I think that's also a happy staffing manager. Let's focus on price, more on value. You know, when we survey our buyers, they always, always, quality is, a, quality is job one. That is at the top of their concerns. 
Um, look at the evolution of the HR business partner, um, you know, when you talk to firms. And, uh, you know, there's less focus on price. There's definitely more on value. Um, you know, we have companies, large companies out there who actually their HR business partners are now going to the business and saying, you know what, all right, you want to engage a resource for this job, but what is the best type of resource? Is it, a sta is it an agency worker? Is it an independent contractor? What geography does it make sense to engage this worker in? Where does the talent lie? Um, where does the less risk lie? So those, there's all of those that are going into these decisions. That's way different than saying, you know, I need a, an admin here for this. These are uh, consultative HR partners that are um, working with the hiring managers. Managers, and remember here, we're the we're the talent agents. Um, you know, we know how to do this. So you guys out there are actually, um, you know, the agents for the triumph of talent. So. Um, there's one more scenario, the good old days, right? We all know that data privacy is a major global concern. Um, you know, the, um, imagine though if there's, you know, n no internet. You know, it's easy if you try. Let's go back to the good old days, right? Paper resumes, gross margin above 30%, volume below 50%. Again, staffing firms are trusted talent agents. So even if there was a massive unplugging and disconnecting, um, we'd just go back to the good old days, right? And then we'd have those big old computers, we'd have uh, Seinfeld on again, and look at the phones. Can you believe those phones? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, uh, and what is Bill Gates holding? What is that thing? Is that a floppy disk? Wow. Okay. This will happen. So, in 2014, uh, buyers reported that 18% of their workforce would, was contingent. In 2016, they're reporting that 20% of their workforce will be contingent. Some companies, as I mentioned before, are at 50% or more. In 2024, the projection, projection is for 22% of the workforce to be contingent. You're the experts. You need to talk about how you can align your strategy, looking at all these crazy new futuristic online staffing, cl human cloud. See if you can uh, look at some of these to incorporate in your future growth. Look at healthcare. Look at manufacturing, IT. Uh, you know, office clerical is uh, you know it's one of those sectors that's remaining fairly flat. So look at other opportunities that you can get into. You're going to uh, want um, to be innovative, to be a partner to your customer as you always have been, but in new and different ways. Because technology and the way that people want to work and the mix of the population that is working, you have, again, from Gen X to millennials to baby boomers, um, everyone wants to work more flexibly. Technology is an enabler. Figure that out in your workforce and uh, you, in your strategy for future growth. I hope that um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to share is that you, you, know, you will have to adapt to survive, and I hope I've given you an idea, an insight, or some sort of uh, food for thought to share with your colleagues and your customers. It's really um, been my pleasure to speak with you all today, and um, I'm going to open it up for questions now. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll share the presentation uh, with you. I guess um, Amanda will share it within a few days. I'm not sure. Right. Okay. So we are going to go ahead and accept questions now. So if you want to submit your questions using either the Q&A feature or the chat feature. I am also going to open up a poll if you would uh, share some feedback with us. That is now available. And I will read off a few questions that have come in. Um, one of which is, what are the major growth trends for the past years? Okay, thanks, Amanda. Great question. Um, so I think that, you know, we talked about some of it, right? We talked about online staffing. We talked about human cloud. 
you know, BMS is continuing to grow. MSP is sort of, mm, it's not flattening out, but it's certainly not growing at the rate it was before. When I initially uh, was in the uh, marketplace, oh, I would say about 15 years ago, I started with a BMS MSP company, and it was about three people. Now it's about 600 people, so uh, definitely has grown. Um, I think BMS will continue to grow. Uh, of course, online staffing will probably grow and morph and uh, become bigger. It's certainly a market disruptor, but I think it's one of those we have to figure out how to um, incorporate it into our business strategies. Um, we're doing more and more research around online staffing and uh, freelancers, so, uh, you know, more to come on that. But I think uh, VMS is definitely the one to uh, watch in turn and uh, online staffing. Okay. How tough is it to get into SOW work? It's tricky, right? You have to be able to figure out, okay, first of all, I can price a job, right? Not not uh, one engagement, but an entire statement of work, right? Because you have to be able to do that, and you have to be able to work with the managers to come up with that formula. There's a huge upside. It's a different mindset, right? Pricing by project and then supplying the talent. Um, you need to be able to address the project or components of the project from a fixed cost perspective. It's very worthwhile, um, but it's it's tricky. Um, I, I would make sure and engage with your sort of your closest customers, right? This would be an opportunity for customers who you've already been sort of innovative with and you have a good partnership to say, I'd like to do that. That would be interesting to me. <clears throat> Another thing you would need to know um, is is the payment terms and how the payments are all um, functioning around a scope of work type of a project, which might be different than what you're used to in just a contingent work. Yeah, because it's a fixed. Yeah, because it's a fixed cost perspective. So there's um, yeah definite um, gating uh, in terms of payment terms, but uh, that's all part of the package. Yep, yep, just things that you definitely need to think about if you're heading in that direction. Um, what about online staffing? Are companies really using online staffing? Okay, here's the, here's the, big, the big secret here. Yes and no, right? So as of uh, 2014, about 50% of uh, the buyers we surveyed knew about it, but only about 4% of them used it. I think, and this is anecdotally, but we think that what's happening is uh, managers are using online staffing, you know, to get uh, tasks done, right, task-related things, uh, but they're putting it on expense reports so it doesn't get traced back. They just, they're not, it's not coming up under a 1099 or anything in the reporting structure. Most of the time it's a small dollar amount, so, you know, not a huge threat yet, but they are learning about it, and certainly um, the uh, usage will uh, increase as time goes on. Do you think there are particular industries that are more likely to use online staffing? Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, if I, I were if I were going to ask, I would say it was ones that were uh, less risk averse, right? Um, uh, that were that were willing to use online staffing. Um, I would say, you know, technology, you know, IT is not a risk-averse uh, industry. You know, technology is not a risk-averse industry. Um, maybe creative, right? Creative might be more uh, likely to use online staffing, some sort of, um, you know, that type of thing. Sure. Um, and you had mentioned the pay range finder. Is that available to um, people who are not corporate members? Uh, it is not available if you're not a corporate member, no. Okay, so that's one of those um, additional benefits you get if you are a corporate member. Right, and if people are interested in becoming a corporate member, I'm happy to, um, they can reach out to me. I think you have my contact information. Yes, I did just go ahead and put up the contact information. If you have any other questions, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to Adrian or myself directly. Um, it doesn't look like at the moment I have any other additional questions that have come in, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I'd like to thank our presenter um, for our, all our participants for their time today, and absolutely, Adrian, for sharing your knowledge of staffing trends. We will have the recording available on Tricom's website. 
It will be available at tricom.com under the Resources and Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information to come out on our next webinar session, May 21st, presented by Essential Staff Care for an Affordable Care Act update. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Amanda, and thanks, everyone.